I, I listed eight things that went wrong for Alabama last night, and they won. I, I consider it the pinnacle of Saban's coaching. They lost a left tackle. They had to change quarterbacks. They missed yeah. Jimmy Field goals. I mean, there was a, they were basically playing a semi-road game. Yeah, until Tua came in the game, the game was actually pretty sloppy. It was officiated sloppy. It was played sloppy, in particular on the Al- Alabama side. I thought the game plan offensively was limited. <laughs> I mean, limited is, is putting it nicely. I thought Brian Dayball was the worst person in Alabama gear in the first half. I mean, their, their plan for Jalen Hurts was terrible. They made the switch, and then all of a sudden, it, the, the haymakers came out. It's like, from, and to attack a little. I mean, it was, it was great in the second half. It was highly entertaining. And, and Saban, I would agree with you. I think that this year, in particular, in the back half of the season, was maybe his greatest coaching achievement of his lifetime because he was overcoming personnel obstacles that he hadn't had to overcome previously in his tenure at Alabama. So Kirby Smart leaves him a great coordinator and Kirby's clearly great. Nick, by the way, Lane Kiffin leaves him and has been really good. But Colin, it's not just those two though. It's not just those two. Think think about this. He's won six national titles, right? right? If you, if you include the LSU title, if you just take a look at all the coordinators he's done that with, he's won with eight coordinators. Do you know that? Pete, eight. By the way, Pete Carroll started losing coordinators, and the dynasty died. It, it, absolutely. That's part, of, that's part of what is making this so great. Here are the coordinators that Nick Saban has won a championship with at LSU and Alabama. Jimbo Fisher, Jim McElwain, Doug Nussmeyer, Lane Kiffin, Brian Dable, Will, Will Muschamp, Kirby Smart, and Jeremy Pruitt. And these are good coaches that have left. Three defensive coordinators. And, and those offensive coordinators, five offensive coordinators. By the way, five and a half kind of quarterbacks. You could say six. I mean, if you say Hurts and Ta- uh, Tagovailoa, Matt Mock, Greg McElroy, A.J. McCarron, Jake Coker, Jalen Hurts, Tua Tagovailoa. You got to be kidding me. I mean, it, you can compare him to Pete if you want. Pete won a national championship with one group of players and one group of coordinators. He did not do it over a cycle of coordinators, assistant coaches, and players. We have not seen a dynasty like this in the history of college football because we haven't seen someone do this in the 85 scholarship limit era. By the way, we also know that college football, college basketball may be great, but all the money, even Duke's trying to win in football. Even Northwestern built a new facility for football. A lot of programs in this country, Georgia, you know, Penn State, they're not basketball programs. Well, and, and UConn was the case study, right? Because UConn was like, well, we're going to be a basketball school. Now, there are other basketball schools, but they also invest in their football program to be viable. So UConn was just left out in conference or alignment. They're in the American conference so now my, in basketball. So my point is, to really make money in college athletics, you have to be viable in football. Yeah. When Pete was winning, I mean... 30 teams were invested in football. It's like 100 now. It's different now. They're, it's certainly different it's, now. And by the way, now you have to play a conference championship. Pete didn't. Yep. Now you got to play a semifinal game. If Pete won the Pac-12, he got in. He got in. And and listen, I don't want to diminish that that little run. It was great. And, and it was a great run, and they certainly were highly successful. There's, there's some more ties that I think we're going to get to a little bit later between Carroll and Saban and why – you know, looking at those two eras is, is apropos, if you will. But I, I will say this. And, Colin, I sat on this couch two years ago and in 2015, and, and we both talked about how we felt like the Saban era was coming to an end. Yeah. And that, and that his lack of evolution was hurting and maybe even killing Bama. And, listen, we were, we, I, we were wrong. He has adjusted and evolved defensively. That old style of defense that he won with early in his Bama days and at LSU, it's different now. He's got hybrid players on the second and third level, more athletic defenders out there. There's more speed on defense. He's evolved and has dominated now in the new era of college football with the spread offenses and the RPOs, the run pass options. And and I think Nick Saban's the greatest coach that we've ever seen in college football. I agree. No, no, no. I, listen, we all love Calipari. Calipari in a sport where all you have to get is the best high school player and you're a final eight team, right? Yeah. Calipari's got one title in like nine years. Right. To dominate He's the best football, recruiter. Oh, he's the best recruiter. And that's nothing against Calipari. But in basketball, shashevsky has been good for 30 years. Yeah. You don't deal with the violence, the injuries. If you have a big brand, you get four of the top 25 high school players. Nick Saban's had to battle. He gives away his secret sauce every year to his assistants. So sure. they steal secrets. Yeah. They come back and face him. There's never been more money invested. By the way, it's much tougher to win a title today than it was 10 years ago yep. because you have to play more conference games, semifinal games, uh, conference championship games. It's in, And now they have Friday night games, which are tra- 
trap games. Yeah, a lot can, of those weeknight games. Okay, can you can you explain this to me? How in the g- g- did that guy get so okay. open? Okay, you're a former college quarterback. I'm yeah. watching that play, and I'm like, if I'm Georgia's defensive coordinator, my game plan is, hey, you two safeties, go stand in the end sure. zone. And they should have. Uh, okay, here's the deal. There's only one or two play calls that you can possibly make in overtime when you've got <laughs> second and 26. <laughs> All right, listen, there's only a few play calls in the normal time, but when it's overtime and the game's on the line, there's only one or two play calls, and one of them is the all go or all go special. Okay, this is run out of a three by one set. So you got three wide receivers to the uh, yeah. near side of the field, one to the top side. They're running cover two. At this point, that cover two safety, he shouldn't do anything but get wide and off the hash. At minimum, he should be between the the numbers and the hash mark. And the corner in cover two, he's got to put How his hands on the wide receiver. Where's the safety? Well, here's the deal: the safety. He deserves the corner at least getting a hand on the wide receiver, and the safety has got to be wider than the widest God. and deeper than the deepest. It's shocking that Georgia <laughs> played that poorly on that play. Now, it was a great throw. That's yeah. a 48-yard absolute dart. This kid's Russell Wilson. This kid can throw it Holy. now. He throws it from the 48-yard line, Look and he that. throws a dart to the end zone. Oh. But the coverage was horrific. Again, you should never be able to complete the boundary or short side of the field, the boundary go route and all go special against cover two. If you don't have, this is a lot of technical. Yeah, don't stuff. get too if technical. You, My if you don't is dumb. have a flat control, okay, Calling. a flat control route. See, the corner is responsible for I the get flat. It. Yes. Right? The, yeah. the, 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 You're getting technical for us the dumb 10 guys. yards between the line of scrimmage and then 10 yards deep. That's yeah, what I the corner it. is responsible for. If you don't have a route there to hold him, He's just supposed to sink back with the go route. So the corner didn't sink back like he should. The safety didn't get off the half hash like he God. should. And all of a sudden, you've got a wide open wide but, receiver and he throws a dime for a touchdown okay, game over. Two things. Let's get to two things that matter. All you guys bellyache about the college football overtime. All they do is take out kick returners and punters. I've never seen anybody wear a punter's jersey at a stadium. <laughs> what they basically do is they say like a film. Uh, okay, you guys have played for four hours. You're 19-year-old yeah. kids. You've beaten the living you-know-what out of each yeah. other. So what we're going to do is we're going to comprise the game to the things that win it. Coaching, quarterbacking, left tackles, line play, situational sure. football, and field goal kickers. And, and you reward aggressiveness. Look, at Georgia yes! was more aggressive in overtime. They beat Oklahoma. Alabama was more aggressive in overtime. They beat Georgia. That's what happens. You get conservative in overtime if anything the only thing I think should switch about the college overtime is maybe just move the ball to the 30 so just create a little bit more field than the 25 that's it I mean just a small but, a small little adjustment but who has been rewarded I said last aggressiveness night, aggr- by the way the best coach in that game was Nick and quarterbacks running backs that that have talent you know if you miss tackles you're going to get beat you play safe on defense like Georgia did you're going to get beat Oklahoma couldn't tackle second half lost in overtime Georgia last night could have wrapped the game up with tackles the bottom line is overtime in college is just condensing yeah. the parts of football that win titles I think it's better than the NFL overtime oh god yes it's way more yeah. urge- the NFL overtime you play for four hours you each get 13 possessions and let's just play more football yeah, you're it's, obviously it's even Okay, here's the other thing. I don't like an expanded playoff, but I love college football. Okay. I love it. So why would you argue against more college football? Is that your theory? Is that where you're Not headed? Not just that. Nothing's going to change. Georgia, Bama, Clemson are favored to get in next year for not only regional narrative diversity, okay. but for better stories. We don't think everybody in March Madness can win. Sure. But it allows... For the little okay. guy, it, you know what it does, Joel? I, I understand. It gives hope to the central, I northeast, midwestern directional schools. I'm not in the business of giving hope for people that, not are, stri- that are not striving <laughs> for ec- excellence. Okay, so you can call this an elitist mentality, but I'll, I'll just – let me give you an example. You know I went to Col- University of Colorado. Oh, God, that's a hippie school. Yeah, Unbelievable. Ahead. Don't even start. Don't even start. Did you know Colorado – Last week in college basketball, knocked off Arizona State and Arizona, mm-hmm. both top 15 teams. Didn't know that. You didn't know that, right? Why? Because the regular season is garbage, right? So everyone argued for this tournament. How oh, this tournament's so great. This tournament's so great. Well, now that's all that matters is the tournament. The regular season literally is nullified now, I, I, in college basketball. But that's 68 so, I understand that. I understand that. But, but as soon as you grow the playoff past five, those conference champions in every conference get an automatic bid. Okay? Every philosophy that I've seen on the playoff expansion means automatic bid for the conference champ, okay, right? So Bama, the best team in the country, doesn't get in. 
That that's good for the hold sport. On, hold on, hold on. As soon as you say there are automatic bids for conference champions, every single non-league game is meaningless. Calling it doesn't matter at all. You can be a three-loss team losing three non-conference games. If it's ACC or SEC, you can be a four-loss team. You can lose every non-conference game, and it doesn't matter. Why would we try to minimize the impact of the regular season when we could make it more important and make more games more important? See, I, I can give you a 10-team playoff by just saying that you've got to win your conference in order to go, so you've got 10 teams vying for conference champions and, ch and championship I games. I think the committee got it right. Well, sure they sure they got it right, but if you just say you have to win your conference to go, now I, the Iron Bowl means everything. Yeah, so Bama would have had to win. I don't, I'm, not in the, I'm not in the business of re-rewarding a team just because I know they're great. I'm not if in, we're in the business of that, let's give the Vince Lombardi trophy to the Patriots. I'm when not they in undefeated. the business of giving the Pac-12 a shot at a title they didn't deserve. I'm not saying that they get a shot at the title. Again, I'm not for automatic bids. All I'm saying is if you would require teams to win a conference yeah. before going to the playoffs. Now, Bama's a great team. They win the national championship, yeah. and kudos to them. There's, there's no doubt about that. I think Saban has cemented himself as the greatest coach in the history of our sport. But this idea that eight teams in a playoff would make our sport better is is false. Um, gonna, it is false. Uh, the unintended consequences of what that would do to the most meaningful and most unique you know regular what, season in all the sports. You know, what you, you don't want like, that. You sound like guy who said if you raise the speed limit to sixty five, everybody will die on the freeway. And we no, did. No, and car accidents no, because went this is, down. This is this is not an opinion. This is. Factual. No, you whoa, whoa. can lose every non-conference game yeah, but you, and still go to the playoffs. That's not going to happen because everybody plays Mercer twice. You know, Ohio State's not going to suddenly lose all their conference games. Yeah, but any non-conference game that has any sort of merit in in this system or even a, a fixed system that I would argue for, the Ohio State. Uh, Oklahoma game wouldn't have mattered at all. Florida State, Alabama wouldn't have mattered at well, all. It's, it, I mean, it's literally it, there just it, for window dressing. Well, by the Why, way, this, wi window dressing what, is fine. Colin, but the f the best thing college football has going for it is that the regular season is the most unique and most important in all of sport. But it so why it, would we erode that? Uh, I don't think you're erode. I, I would argue there's 120 programs. Alabama, the same teams would still end up. Georgia beat Notre Dame. I think we're overreacting. We overreact. But you're trying to reward teams that aren't great teams. No, what I'm saying is... What's a good story? I want a I, good story. Yeah, Listen, we'd sports like is to, a, We make more money as broadcasters if more people longer care about no, sports. No, we would lose money because our, our non-conference slate of games would be meaningless. No, it would mean more people would say, I got to watch Cowherd and Clatt argue because my team may get in. As it is now, it's like, I'm not Bama, I'm not Georgia, I'm not Clemson next year. Bye-bye, Clatt and Cowherd. Oh, I, okay, I, I totally go. disagree. It's the, I, Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.